speaker today, Dr. Fries, brings us back to next generation sequencing, microarray, and metabolomics technology here at GGC beyond disabilities. Yeah. Is it working all right? Yeah. All right, good deal. Um, so this was my assigned topic, and I really obviously um, wondered what I was going to say after everybody else <laughs> told you everything else, you know, the, the, the interest and uh, sort of a lot of the historical things related to, to GGC have been on full display, I think, today. Um, but the answer um, to my question is, I think the time is right, and so hopefully I'll say this at least a couple, a few more times throughout my um, presentation. And so, in saying that, I want to focus on this moving beyond disabilities. I, I think the key word is beyond. And so, not away, but beyond. And so, in terms of thinking beyond, but obviously no less committed to our, um, our, our strengths with interests related to intellectual disability, autism, and birth defects. So, that's, that's first and foremost. And so, those of you that are, are familiar with the, the longstanding history at GGC, um, I'm, I'm sort of curious what your thoughts are <coughs> in answering this question. <laughs> and so the, the right answer is hopefully D. Um, I'd also accept A and D and B and D. Um, C, hopefully not quite yet. So if everything works in threes, and we've, we've, we've seen this already quite a bit today, um, but a lot of what we do and, and a lot of the way I think about things in terms of how things move through the lab and the different sections that we have, obviously, um, we base things on the central dogma of molecular biology and the flow of information. And obviously, there's many nuances and subtleties and rules and rules that are meant to be broken. Um, but when we sort of shift this towards the whole world of omics, this is what it looks like. Um, and this is one way to keep this in, in a set of threes in terms of information. And before anybody jumps on me, I realize it, that the, the lab is not where everything starts, right? <laughs> so it starts with patients, their families, clinical visits, and a lot of things happen before a sample is ever collected and submitted to the laboratory. But for the sake of this slide, sort of uh, work with me on this. It's, it's still information. And, and then sort of in thinking about this, one of the things I've always wondered or sort of felt um, from the early days of, of, of my time here at GGC, we've always thought about treatment, but at, at some point we almost sort of seemed like a diagnosis being made was a destination. And at this point, a diagnosis is just really the beginning. So it's really the launching point to move forward in terms of what the prognosis is and what you can do about potentially treating the, the features or the condition and the, and the patient that's in front of you. And so obviously the, the point of this is to try to cut to the chase. If you have something genetic going on, whatever it may be, you want to minimize that diagnostic odyssey from weeks or months or years into a much shorter period of time. And so this is sort of kind of the, the gist of what we want to be a part of. And so whenever I get assigned or asked to do a talk like this, for some reason I go back to my previous talks hoping I can at least <laughs> swipe a couple slides <laughs> just to, to make it easier. And so I, I picked out some of my pictures and you can sort of add your own subtitles because some of these are, are well used sort of genomic sort of talks from different meetings and people use all these things and you know, saying genetics is at the core of everything. You know, genomics is like an iceberg, there's a lot more substance under the surface and genes don't work in a vacuum and everything has to work in concert. The picture on the right, I just like because it's pretty. <laughs> um, and then the needle in the haystack thing comes up and obviously it depends on how big the needle is or how good your detector is. And this is another one where obviously we're dealing, at least from a DNA perspective, we're dealing with thousands of variants. And so, you know, I, I always, I always uh, enjoy hearing everyone's take on this. You know, Dr. Dr. Spronger made a great case for why you have to look at the patient, get all those x-rays, look at their hands. It, it sort of made me think, if somebody asks you, say, talk to the hand. <laughs> <laughs> but we're, we're dealing with a lot of information and we're trying to obviously cut to the chase. So when we talk about genomics, 
genomics has been around for a long time, and I think we all have a pretty good idea of what genomics really is or means. If you ask each of us to define it, it might come out a little bit differently. And you know, for me, genomics often refers to the, to the toolbox. I've heard genomics being the toolbox of things that you have to work with to study genomics or complex genomics, and all these issues come up. And the other analogy I like to use is, is the following using the, the railroad in terms of DNA sequencing. So what once was a very manual, labor-intensive process, and you didn't get to go very far, very fast sort of moved to the next and became a much more sort of industrial endeavor but with a lot of hot airs, sort of a lot of work involved. And, and what I'll suggest now is that the train on the right is sort of where we're at. And I was trying to think through this analogy a little bit further and I thought, okay, well, each one of those boxcars may be a chromosome's worth of information. And the engine may actually be health and well-being basically driving everything forward. And then, unfortunately, I got to the end and I thought maybe the caboose was the Y chromosome. <laughs> and as you know, most trains don't have cabooses anymore. <laughs> so I didn't really want to have that obsolete thought in my mind. But, but this, is, this is where we want to go. It's, it, we want to be fast, efficient, sleek, elegant, and have all these things going on. And some of it's easy. Some of it's not so easy because of the layers of complexity. So. This has already been touched on in great detail, and I don't want to belabor the point, but I don't want to be accused of ignoring the metabolic side. So obviously you can think in terms of simple enzymatic pathways, single enzymatic reactions, but it gets complex real fast. And if that's not enough, then you, you get what Adam's looking at and trying to sort of forge the way with metabolomics. And so again, there's just massive layers of complexity in everything that we do. So one of the other things that, uh, that I like to reflect on often after going to a meeting sometimes is to just say, okay, what was presented and sort of take stock in what it is that's going on in the field and sort of where do we sit? Are we doing the right things? Are we moving in the right direction? So this is the 2016 sort of ASHG um, platform presentation talks summarized into their key features or key sort of uh, headers. And obviously there's massive overlap to everything, but this adds up to 72 sessions. There were actually 90 the other remainders that I haven't put up here were related to the awards and other sort of platform presentations where they, they picked the best different abstracts and everything. But if you look at this, it's really the same as it's been for a long time. And we're still gathering information and we're still learning as we go. And so, again, when I say why are we doing some of the things that we're doing, I think because the time is right. We can't just sit around and wait for everything to be known and feel like we are at the right place. And so we really have this need to, to have more technical specialization, but in other, other cases, less other types of specialization so that we can forge ahead with the tools that have been developed. And so this is, this is why one of the things that we've decided that we want to do, at least some of us, I think, is to get into other genetic conditions beyond the, the conditions that GGC has historically been, been recognized for looking at and, and, and seeing clinically and working with in the laboratory, both diagnostically and from a research perspective. We know virtually every one of these systems in this, you could, I'm sure you can name a few more, Everything, if something's gonna go wrong, there's something likely genetic underpinning whatever this syndrome condition or situation may be. So again, we know that we should be working in a lot of different directions and, and hopefully making a difference, if not sort of outside the, the borders of South Carolina, at least for our population in South Carolina. So everyone's probably seen this, and this is one of these probably should be retired slide categories, but I've, I've taken this one and some of you have seen me do this. And for a number of years, DNA sequencing was following the, the trend of Moore's Law, where you have basically a doubling of speed and technology every 18 to 24 months. And with the advent of next generation sequencing, the cost per genome has dropped considerably, and this obviously only goes out to 2012, 
And if you look ahead, the, co the cost per genome still continues to drop, but this whole notion of being at $1,000 or less is not there yet. And even if it is there, it does not include any interpretation or any other meaningful sort of extraction of information. And so my, my uh, amazing abilities in PowerPoint allow me to flip things upside down and do this and label it this way. And so the question is, when are those two lines at the bottom going to intersect? When are we going to understand all the information we have? And the answer is, who knows, but certainly not in our lifetime. And maybe when that day comes, it'll be a great thing, but there will probably be other, other issues to deal with at that point. But again, so this is the, the, the answer in terms of asking why now, and, and I'd say why not now. I think the time is right to, to move beyond into some of these other areas. So one of the things or the mottos that the Diagnostic Laboratory here at GGC has, has used for a number of years now, um, with credit given to Joan Bishop for coming up with it, is giving greater care. Every single sample we like to think that comes into our laboratory should be given greater care or the greatest <coughs> care possible. And so one of the decisions that we've made is to make a larger than usual investment over the next couple of years in our diagnostic um, laboratory. And it comes in a lot of different ways. Some of it's just broadening our test menu on fronts that we're already working on, um, working with developing and adopting and adapting new technologies, spending more time looking into cancer-related testing opportunities, and then all the other things that you have to put in place to sort of facilitate these things in terms of modernization and then on the bottom, some of the, the business-related things in terms of marketing, having more visibility, and certainly working on the billing side so that reasons for samples not being submitted to our laboratory don't revolve around billing issues, whether it's internally or from others around the state or hopefully at some point solving a lot of those issues for out-of-state samples from institutions that would like to, to be able to send things to us, but they can't because we don't have the right billing solution in place. This is more the same. The investment side is going to go towards equipment, some automation, certainly a need for more informatics, and personnel to help things on all these fronts. We've made a decision to put a lot more effort into metabolomics, which is not just the only reason Adam was here, but because of our work related to the, to the research being done with autism and thinking beyond. We think metabolomics is a, is a big deal, but it's still sort of in its early phases of implementation, and we still have a long ways to go to, to learn as much as we need to, to know about it, to, to really sort of capitalize on the power that it brings along with some of the other omics that we're already sort of a little more familiar with. Um, and then the other things just relate to industry-based contracts, the ability to, to work with clinical trials, we're already doing a fair bit of that, primarily related to work going on in the, the biochemical laboratory here at GGC. But the whole, the, the whole idea of, of showing this to you is hope, hopefully sort of uh, generating at least some ideas or at least the recommendation or suggestion that we might be in position to work with others outside of the, the, the GGC environment to, to work either with contracts or trials or, or whatever it may be. So one, one example I'll just give quickly on the oncology side is a product called Oncoscan from Affymetrics, where it's a microarray platform that is able to use um, DNA isolated from FFPE tissue, and you can go through and see all the specifics, but it's intended to be a much higher resolution platform for oncology and allow us to, to target certain actionable mutations as well. And so there's a lot of reasons that this would be one of the things that we would want to put sort of first and foremost on our list of to-do things. One of those being we have a lot of experience with microarray technology. The other thing is, and you can go through the list, I won't read all these out, but getting towards the bottom, it shows that a lot of that information can be utilized for treatment-related decision-making. And not only that, a lot of this type of information can hopefully be sort of wrapped into nicer, more comprehensive packages when we start thinking in terms of 
not just CMVs as standalone issues, sequencing as a standalone technology, but incorporating metabolomics and anything else um, that you can think of in terms of getting a bigger and more comprehensive picture. And so if, again, going back, Dr. Stronger wants more than one x-ray. In some cases, we, want, we may want more than one test to give you a better idea of what's going on, and especially given we have all these variants showing up both on array and on sequencing that we still are not able to define very well. So one of the other things is liquid <coughs> biopsy. Um, and this, this is a term that, that gets used a lot in primary <coughs> being able, with, with conversation of being able to pick up cancer very early on before there's any <coughs> symptoms. And one of the things I read, this is not my quote, but whether or not liquid biopsy is the stethoscope for the next 200 years, I, I'm not sure. 200 years is a long time. <laughs> Um, but this is already going on, and you can imagine there's lots of different applications, a lot of different things going on. Um, whether or not NIPT in the prenatal setting is a liquid biopsy, I, I think you could argue that it probably is. But having experience and being able to, to dial in and look for things, whether they're mosaic or just circulating cells, circulating DNAs, to pick up things that you don't have easy access to with a blood sample, this is another one of these areas where I think we have a lot to look forward to in terms of the power of technology. One of the other things that's always asked is even with all the strengths that we have with microarray, with sequencing, everything else going on, why do we still have so many patients that don't get a diagnosis? Are we looking in the right place? Are we looking with the right resolution? And there's you know, figures where you've lost your keys out on the street, and the only way you can find them is if you look under the light post with the lamp on. But if you drop your keys in the dark, and you're not looking in the right place, you'll never find them, right? So this is sort of part of that. We need to, to expand on degrees of resolution. So I'm just going to give you a couple quick sort of looks at other technologies that are in the process of sort of coming of age and, and, and moving us forward. One of them is from a company called 10X Genomics, where you can use basically next generation sequencing with additional molecular barcodes to help map back short read data to the genome. And, and I'm not getting into this in, in great detail, but what it's meant to allow us to do is to look at finer levels of resolution in terms of structural variation. So for all the structural variation that we're able to pick up, just due to copy number changes, and then you look at how many variants we have from a sequencing perspective, you can imagine there's gonna be an enormous amount of variation that's happening at a very small level of resolution. It's too small to pick up with a microarray, but it's probably too large to pick up with DNA sequencing using current technology, even if you're doing long read things. So this is one example where I think there's going to be a wealth of new information, but what's going to be challenging is to weed through all of that variation to figure out what is important clinically and what really is just random variation in any given population. One of the other technologies that I think we can look forward to, to seeing more of, this is a technology that's been around for at least a few years now, is something called nanopore sequencing. One of the companies is called Oxford Nanopore, and, and basically it's using synthetic nanopores on, on a, basically a semiconductor type platform where you're sequencing using more or less digital technology and electrical current sequencing to do things really quite fast and efficiently. And the, the one thing I'll say about it is um, can't read this very well, but the Smidge Ion is the smartphone compatible sequencer. So literally, you might be able to sequence and plug it into your phone and be doing whatever it is you want to do. And so on, on, on that front, I'll, I'll just mention one other thing because I, I usually don't get into things like 23andMe and Ancestry.com, but there's a new company. How, how many of you have heard of Helix? So some of you know about Helix. Helix is one of these new big companies out in California, Southern California, closely connected with Illumina, but part of what they want to do is create this world of apps 
to be able to play with your genome on your phone or whatever it may be. And there's an enormous amount of effort and money being invested into this. And whether you buy into this technology or whether you like the idea of it, it's where there's a lot of interest and a lot of things happening. And so Helix's point is sequence wants query often and to be able to do lots of different things. And some of us think, well, that's not a very good idea. Um, but it's, it's where we're going. This is where there's a lot of people pushing to make sort of genomics and your, your genomic profile very available so you can do with it as you please. Um, and the only thing I'll say in addition to that is it, it sort of brings back this notion of a, of a rising tide um, raises all ships. I think this is part of what's happening with genetic literacy. So as people become more familiar with technology and what DNA really is, what it means, and how it's utilized, we'll see a lot more of this in the future. The other reason that I say the time is right is just look in gene tests. Look at the enormous diversity of tests that are out there. And the interesting thing is, and I know GGC is not the only lab in South Carolina doing business, but if you go in and look under the labs, I guess you can search by state. And at least for the time being, GGC is still the only lab listed in South Carolina. But we've got plenty of people knocking on our door, and I'm sure everyone does, you know, sales reps and other people, you know, trying to, to tell you what they're doing, whether they're from Invitae, GeneDx, wherever it may be. And this is, again, part of this sense of urgency to, to remain relevant and to get into some of the other fields of genetics that we think our state needs. Um, there's, a, there's a resource called ClinGen, and this is something that I'm a part of, and I'm not sure how many people know, but ClinGen is sort of a partner effort to ClinVar, clinical variation. <coughs> and it's a funded um, program through the NHGRI along with a couple other funding sources, but the goals are basically to centralize a lot of the database things that are going on right now so that you don't have to have your own sort of private um, database and, and uh, information. This is a way to open things up to, to make things readily available. So if somebody's learned a lesson from a particular variant, or a particular gene, but a lot of that information can be consolidated and everybody should have access to it. So you'll, you'll see more of this in ClinVar, I think, in the future. And let, let me just close with, with a couple more slides. Um, I would say this should be assigned reading for all the trainees in, in, the, in the room right now. Um, it's from Natasha and Jonathan. Um, Jonathan's one of the, the big drivers of ClinGen. He's, or they're both up at UNC Chapel Hill, and I'm not going to get into this, but the thing I'm always curious about is point four. Um, how will the clinical use of NGS and other technologies affect the relationship between clinicians and laboratorians? And in the early days of exome sequencing, I always joked that it seemed like we were having a negotiation of what the information really meant, rather than the lab people just saying, here it is, take it or leave it, you know, this is the best we can give you. It's, it's become a really sort of much more involved back and forth conversation. And whether you can stick the landing on the first review and find a de novo mutation and make a diagnosis, that's great. But if you don't, you know, you're going to be back looking again and hopefully um, having a good relationship um, with your local uh, lab is a, is a good way to, to facilitate that. So I don't have, well, I do have a summary slide, but it's a little out of the norm, so I'm, I'm a little hesitant to do this, but I'll do it anyways. Um, shifting sands in the diagnostic world. I, I don't know if I was in my office too late or delusional or what, <laughs> but feel free to read along if you'd like, okay? Change is inevitable. Science advances. Strategies fluctuate. Partnerships realign. You gotta wait for it. Get over it. <laughs> Find help. Evolve. Technically, genetically, and genomically. And you know why? Political. No, the time is right. <laughs> so that's it. Thank you.